My name is Dave Morrow. Nine months of each year, I live out of my vehicle. I travel the wilderness by foot on an endless backpacking and landscape photography trip. I want to teach and share the photography and outdoor skills that I use on these trips. I don't want to spend hours editing video or sitting in front of a computer, so I made some rules. First, everything shot on GoPro. This was the best way I found to record quickly on a consistent basis. Second, I can only spend 20 minutes editing each video. So thanks for watching, and welcome to the Landscape Photography Journals. Good morning. I am high up above one of the valleys in the Sierra Nevada range of California. You can see all the mountains over there. And it's about 7 a.m., so the sun just came up. If you look down this way, see where it's starting to hit the top of those bristlecone pines. Those trees are ancient. Some are 45 to 5,000 years old, I believe. Maybe even older. They have like the perfect ecosystem to live in. So they're doing pretty well. But today I'm gonna to take a shot, which is zoomed in on those really nice clouds and peaks back there. And you can see all this fog down in the valley. Some of it's also smoke. I think there's a fire going somewhere up north there. And then along with that peaks back there, I'm also gonna capture this old tree that has really nice color in it right down here in the foreground. So to do that, I'm gonna shoot with a 28 to 300 millimeter lens, and I'm shooting at about 70 millimeters. So my goal here is to compress this scene in so you can see the log, and then all these layers, and then the mountains will be at the very top of the composition. Since I'm shooting at 70 millimeters here, it's gonna be key for me to take two different focal points, because I'm zoomed in pretty far, so that log's in the immediate foreground, but then the far background is so far back there in differential to that log that if I don't take two separate exposures with two different focal points, either the background or the foreground will not be in focus. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I've placed these mountains within the top third of my composition. I don't wanna to include too much of that sky up there because if I include a large amount of the sky, say that much, instead of just a little bit, above the top of the mountains, then the mountains won't be dominant in the top of the scene. They won't look quite as large. So you can always remember, if you wanna make something look really large in the background, don't leave too much, just maybe a little bit of the sky right above it. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna grab a single point spot focus, and I'm gonna do that about two thirds into this scene. Because remember, I'm gonna grab the focal point in the back, which will focus on about the top two thirds of the scene. And then the bottom third of the scene, I'll grab with that extra focal point just for the foreground. So I'm just grabbing a single point spot focus two thirds of the way back. And I'll show you where it's at, right there. Now, after I do that, I'm gonna select F11 for my F-stop value. That'll keep the image nice and sharp from about one third all the way back to the very top of this scene. After I do that, I'm gonna verify that I'm ISO 100. And then I'll just pull my histogram up and I'm gonna push it right until it's almost to the very edge on the right-hand side, but not touching. And that's just gonna make sure I don't blow out any of these light areas up here, but I still retain the full dark detail of these shadow areas right there. And at that point, with a five second timer, I'll just push the shutter button. So now that that's taken, I wanna make sure that my histograms look good. I'll pull up on my histograms. You can see that none of them are blown out. That includes the RGB at the top, then the red, green, and blue channels. So that looks good. Now, for that specific raw file, it's slightly overexposed for the clouds up there in the top. I can just darken those down in post-processing. And that's a lot better method than going from a dark image and then having to pull the detail back out of it. You'll get a lot better color and light if you slightly overexpose, as long as you're not blowing out the image. So now, the second one, I'm just gonna go down here, right to that log in the foreground. And I'm gonna focus right on that log. And I just zoomed in at 100% to do that. So by zooming in at 100%, 
I can use the back button focus, autofocus on my camera, and I can see if it's perfect or not. If it's not perfect, I can just dial in the focal ring and make sure it is perfect. And that's one of the advantages of not having the focus on the shutter button. So when I take the picture, it won't try to refocus. I only focus by using the back button on my camera. So once again, if I'm watching the histogram here, I've selected F11 for this shot as well, and ISO 100. But my last step being dial in the exposure using exposure compensation. If I'm watching the histogram, I'm only worried about that bump right there. That reflects all this area right down there. So I'm going to push that up a little bit brighter. If this is slightly blown out in the top, that's okay, because I've grabbed another focal point. So I'm going to blend these two shots together anyway. So if you ever want to improve your shot when refocusing by increasing or decreasing the exposure, that's a good time to do it. Now for this shot, I'm going to review the histogram again like I did before. And you can see all the channels are slightly blown out, but that's okay because they're for this portion of the image. I also want to check the focus in the bottom of this image. And that looks good. So now I can load both of these shots into Photoshop and I'll process them and blend them together. And it's super simple for a shot like this. I'll show you how to do it. All right, so here are the two photos that I just captured out in the field. This first one, was the one that was focused back here. And I just wanna just verify first by zooming in. So we can check out where this focus extends from. So if we look back at the mountains, and I'll darken it down so you can see it a little bit better. Mountains are sharp. It's hard to tell what's sharp in here in these clouds. But we can always check down on the foreground. That looks sharp as well. And you'll see everything right back in these trees looks all right. But once we get to this line, right about in here, the sharpness starts to drop off. And you can see that this stump, which I focused on in the second exposure, is not sharp in this exposure. So this will be the exposure that we use for everything beyond this line right here, out in this direction. And then we can take a look at this second exposure where I refocused right here, and I also brightened the exposure up a little bit, just to capture that extra light and detail down in here. Because I didn't really care about what happened in this part of the image, because I won't be using that in my final combination within Photoshop. So I can darken this a little bit, so we can verify that this is sharp as well. And you can see that that tree is very sharp. All these plants in the foreground are sharp. But if we look back to this transition line right here, you can see the sharpness starts to drop off as soon as we get back to these trees. And even more so as I go back to the distant background where the mountains are. So that just proves my theory or my guess that I needed to focus stack for this shot. So in this next part, I'll show you guys how to combine these. But before we do so, I first want to state that this is a more advanced, or I guess you could say intermediate level tutorial. So if you don't understand anything that I'm covering, you can watch the rest of the videos in this series that come before this one, and then you will clearly understand what I'm talking about in this video. They kind of all go together as an additive process. Another thing I also wanted to make mention of is that for 95% of your shots, you really don't need to use this focus stacking method, maybe even 99% of your shots. So if you really want to be efficient in your process for taking images, you need to know how each of your lenses reacts to different scenarios and which situations you actually need to use focus stacking for, for those specific lenses. So in most cases, you can just use the hyperfocal distance, as I taught two tutorials ago. And if you notice that hyperfocal distance is dropping off in the immediate foreground, in the bottom of your image, that kind of tips you off that you need to use focus stacking for that specific image. So always go out and test all these theories and get to learn them for your own specific camera and lens setup because they won't work exactly the same unless you're shooting with the exact same camera and lens that I have. So always go and experiment and test anything that anybody teaches you to make sure that it actually works for your own gear. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to select this image first. This is the image that is focused for everything beyond this point out towards infinity. 
And I'm just going to get a quick process of that. So I will add a little bit of contrast here. Pull up the shadows. Drop the whites and the highlights. And I'm not going to do a full edit of this because I just want to show you guys the blending method here. So I'm just trying to get this photo to look very close to what I saw when I was out shooting. And that's the only thing I'm trying to do when editing raw files. I'm trying to make the image that I see on the screen match very closely to what I saw without shooting. So I don't want to blow out any highlights. I don't want to lose any blacks. And I also want to make sure that my histogram matches the specific parts of the image that I saw while out there capturing the image. So that looks good there. I'll drop this down a little bit for the exposure. Then I'll go down to Tone Curve, bring up the lights a little bit, maybe drop the blacks. Something in there is close enough to what I saw while I was out shooting. Then what I can do is I can match this second exposure to the first exposure, so the color and the other settings will be identical. So I can hold down Command, that would be Control on a PC, I'm editing it on a Mac, and then I can click this other image here. So once they're both selected, I can just hit sync, check all, and synchronize. So what that will do is I now have the first image and then the second image. And you'll remember I lightened that second image up slightly for this foreground. So what I can also do is reselect the first image while holding down command on a Mac or control on a PC. I can select the second image, and then I can come up here to settings, I believe, and under settings, I can come down here to match total exposures. So this will match the exposures of the second image I selected to whatever the exposure of the first image is. So it'll just make sure that the brightness is equal across both images. So when I click that, you'll notice now I have my first image and my second image are the same brightness across both. So that looks good. So at this point, I want to make sure that all my raw processing is done. Usually I use what are called smart objects to work within Photoshop, meaning I can bounce back and forth between working in Photoshop layers and camera raw. But when you do the layering method that I'm about to show you for focus stacking, you can't jump back and forth in that smart object workflow. So you have to make sure that your raw files are perfect when you're about to use this method. So I think these look good. They're well enough balanced that I can work with them. If I was going to work them through on a real process, I would probably take a little bit longer to develop the raw file. So now I'm just going to select both images. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to right click. If I right click on either of the images, I can go to export here. And I just have this export set up. All that does is it sends these out as raw files with the specific settings that I just showed you embedded in them. And that'll just send them out to the location that I choose. Now I like to export instead of open right into Photoshop because if I export these files, I actually make a duplicate copy of them. So I don't ever have to worry about messing up the original files which are sitting in my raw file library. If I make this duplicate copy, then I can make mistakes and delete these files and I don't have to worry about throwing away the initial raw file. So I'll just click export here and that will send them out to a folder that I have pre-designated. But you can send it anywhere you like. The real goal is the theory, not the actual step by step. Alright, so here is the file I have raw in work. And here are the two images, and I'm just in Adobe Bridge. That's where I like to view all of my raw files before I open them up in Adobe Photoshop. So here's the first file, and here's the second file. You can see they are .nef, which is still Nikon raw file format. So I'll just select this first file, hold down Command or Control on a PC, and then select the second file. With both of these files selected, I'm going to go up here to Tools, and under Tools, you'll see this drop-down for Photoshop. And within Photoshop, you'll see Load Files into Photoshop Layers. So this will take both of these files and layer them one on top of another in Photoshop. So I can blend them together so it'll look like one file 
which is actually the combination of the focus stack parts of two files. All right, so we are now within Photoshop. So the first thing I'm going to do is label these. I'm going to first figure out which is which. So I'll just zoom in here and I'll turn this top file off and on. So I can see that this top file is the one that's focused on the log. So I'll just label that FG for foreground. And I'll just label this one back for background. Whatever you want to do so they are easy to blend together. So I can just zoom back out here to full size. And the first thing I want to do with these is I'm going to put this background image on top of this layer stack. And this is not a Photoshop tutorial, so if you don't understand layer masking and layers and all that good stuff, you can check out some of my previous tutorials where I discuss that. But it's a little bit too much to go over in this basic tutorial. This is just about focus stacking. So at this point, I first need to line these up because you can see when I shift focal points, watch how these images slightly move. See how they shift slightly? So even though you're using the same focal length, when you shift the actual focal point within the image, it will shift the image just slightly. So I'm going to first select the top image, and then I'm going to hold down Command, Control on a PC, and select the bottom image. Now I can go up here to Edit, and under Edit, I want to go to Auto Align Layers. So this will just compare the pixels of each image and match them up. I want to go to Auto. I don't want to check either of these. And now I can hit OK. So now you can see when I move these, the images no longer jump. So they are perfectly lined up there for me. So that's great. So now all I need to do here is I need to combine both of these. So I want to combine the background image for everything beyond this point out towards infinity and the foreground image just for this foreground part right here. So all I need to do to do that is I'm going to come down here to my layer masks, that little box with the circle in it, and click on it. Now I'm going to come over here to my brush tool, which is right here, and I want to select that. And I'm going to go with an opacity up here, which I can just select by dragging on the opacity while clicking it up to 100. While in the brush tool, you can also click on the number keypad. So if I click a 9, that'll give me a 90% opacity. If I click a 3, 30%, or 0, 100, so on and so forth. Flow, I will go with 100. And since I'm painting on a white layer mask, I need to select a black brush here. So I can just click this color box, and I'll come down and grab black. So all I'm going to do here is I want to cover up this top layer in the sections right here and below where it is not in focus. So that will combine or show through to the underlying layer beneath it. So I'm just going to zoom in here. And you'll remember before, if I hide this, we can see the areas where the sharp focus is. So it's just coming in about right in here, up in this area, this log is focused, as well as over in this area. So I'm just going to paint through black directly in those areas. So I'll turn this layer back on. Click here with my black brush. I'm just going to start painting right in here. And you'll see the layer mask pile up there. So Black conceals, white reveals. Whatever I paint black on this layer mask will hide this top layer and reveal the underline. And I can always use the right and left brackets to make my brush bigger and smaller. So first I'll just brush through this entire bottom and then I'll handle some of the detailed parts up here after I do that. And you can take a lot more time to do this when you're actually doing it on your own. But I just want to show the actual method. I don't want to bore you guys with taking forever to blend it through. So I can also make a small brush here. Quickly blend through this, like that. 
and then there as well. And if you ever want to see where your brush strokes are or where your layer mask currently lies, there are two options. The first option, which is helpful sometimes, but probably not in this case, is to hold down the Alt button. While holding down Alt, you can click on the mask and it'll actually show you what's black and white. But for a mask like this, I'm going to hit this backslash. I think that's a backslash. Whatever that thing is down there. I always get back and forward mixed up, but I'll hit that and then I can actually see red where I've brushed black on the layer mask. So that can give you a helping hand when fine tuning the very edge of that layer mask. So I can hit that slash again to turn it back off. So I think that looks pretty good there. Make sure we got all that. So all I did here is I combined this background image, which was focused for everything beyond this line towards infinity, with this foreground image that was focused from everything right about in here down towards the foreground. So now those look good. Now what I noticed was when I zoomed in here, let's turn this off and on, off and on. I can see that my brush strokes got a little bit too far out around the edges. You can see where it's blurry. So I can always grab a white brush here. And after I grab that white brush, I can just make sure that I've selected my layer mask and paint that really fine edge right around there. So everything is sharp in the final image. So it's just all about dialing that edge in. Then I can always shift back to the black brush and get that dialed in. So I think that looks pretty good for a first pass. So after I'm all done with that, I've done my blend. I can select this top layer. I can hold shift, select this bottom layer, and I can come up here to layer and group layers. And this will just put them in this group. And I can just call this focus stack blend. And from there, I can continue to do any other adjustments that I see fit for this specific image. But that is my basic walkthrough on how I go through my focus stacking method to blend images. And like I said, don't use this all the time and make your life more complicated, but figure out the special use cases when you do need it and learn the best way to use it in those cases so you can have really nice sharp images from front to back. So thanks for watching, guys. I will see you next week on Tuesday for the next video.